thanks a lot for um, yeah, giving me the opportunity to present this uh, work in progress uh, that I've been working on. Um, I'll present to you a strategy or a new strategy to uh, model RNA-seq data from uh, genomic sequence with uh, convolutional neural networks. So this, this was from Jacob before. Uh, um, sequence approximation models have been kind of been established as a very useful tool to um, model molecular phenotypes that we can measure, for example, with attack seq. Um, usually, these models use a genomic sequence around the measured phenotype as input, um, send it to the convolutional neural network, and then make the prediction um, of, the, of the measured phenotypes. And then afterwards, we can go actually back with these models, and that's nice because they're using convolutions. We can then uh, see what kind of features they learn um, that are important to the models to make the prediction, and also these features actually resemble the uh, sequences that are bound by the biological factors that cause this um, uh, measured phenotype. Um, most of these models are trained in a multi-task fashion, where um, earlier layers learn sort of like a combination of features or like a useful representation that is then used by the last layer only to be separated into different, for example, cell types or different data modalities um, to make predictions for all of these from this uh, common representation. And so the, the goal of these models is, is really eventually that we can use them to um, perform experiments that we wouldn't be able to do um, at the bench. Um, and so, for example, you, with these models, we can then go in, go back, and then say, all right, we, we perform any type of um, um, variation to the sequence, uh, send it through the model, and let it predict what would be the, the effect of this prediction. So these models are really meant to be um, varying e effect predictors, eventually. And so while they have performed pretty well on a whole bunch of um, varying effect prediction benchmarks, um, Earlier this year, we set out to basically test them and see how well are they performing on predicting differences between expression of different individuals. And so what we used was the informer model. So at that point, like the most elaborate, largest model that was out there. Um, and we used whole genome sequencing data of 839 uh, people um, that was paired with uh, RNA-seq data. And so we sent these, uh, these sequences um, that were like 200,000 uh, base pair long which had about like 100 to, to 1,000, a couple thousand um, variations to the reference um, through the model and then compared the predictions of the model with the ob observed data. And so here on the right, you see this for one gene, GDX11. Um, you, you see the measured values on the x-axis and the predicted values on the y-axis. And you can see that the model is kind of um, able to uh, identify um, clusters of people with high, medium, and, and low uh, expression. That results in like a pretty high correlation value. But when we did this for 6,000 expressed genes in frontal cortex, we observed that um, sort of it's like a 50-50 chance that um, the model either gets a, uh, gets a positive or a negative correlation. However, the interesting thing is that even though like it's, it's a negative correlation, a lot of these negative correlations were also um, significantly strong. And so when we investigated this further, or, like we had this idea that this could be potentially that the model learns um, false regulatory grammar um, that basically would give it the wrong direction of the effect. However, when we investigated this further, we saw that it's actually not like a misinterpretation of the regulatory grammar, but it's more like a um, uninformed bias towards um, variants that are close to TFS. So basically, the model doesn't really know how to um, pr predict changes with um, differences between individuals. And so one of the reasons we think that the model isn't able to predict these differences is um, that it doesn't know anything about post-transitional regulation. So Informa and also most of the other models are trained on large data sets that are mostly covering transcriptional processes. But as the study here on the left suggests, um, we can see an enrichment of causal variants not only in in, uh, in, in regions that are associated with transcriptional processes, but also on, uh, especially in regions that are associated with post-transcriptional processes, such as, for example, the 5 form UTR, the 3 form UTR, or even the coding region. And so while these data sets exist, for example, FlipSeq for um, the location of RNA binding protein um, binding, or other sequencing techniques for measuring mRNA stability, um, there are very few of those compared to um, other types of data sets. And also when, they're, when they exist, it's often just like in a single cell type. And so we're suggesting to 
use RNA-seq um, directly um, to train these two models on. And like historically, it has been a little bit challenging to model RNA-seq because of large range interactions and also because of the different layers of, in a, um, of um, regulation that, that the mRNA go through um, that eventually leads to the abundance of mRNA. However, like just recently, um, there's been a bunch of papers that actually used a similar approach that I will present here um, to model RNA-seq. And so our idea is basically go back and reprocess RNA-seq first, similar to what the approaches um, did that I just mentioned that just came out. Um, and so how we're we doing this, basically from this very simple model here of the life cycle of an mRNA, um, we can determine that the transcription rate is sort of proportional to the amount of pre-mRNA. And we can determine that the degradation rate is proportional to the amount of um, pre-mRNA uh, and mature mRNA. And so with this knowledge in hand, we can turn to RNA-seq and we can, uh, we can think about like how we can approximate these, these two values with basically the data that we have. And so when we look at RNA-seq, intronic reads are likely to come from the um, premature mRNA, whereas exonic reads will be used as a proxy for uh, mature mRNA. And so once we use, then once we start covering, mapping basically reads to intronic reads and exonic reads, we can use that information to then get um, three different data modalities from the uh, same RNA-seq data set. So that is uh, transcription rate, expression, and degradation rate. And most importantly here is that now um, that we, we can do this with every data set, we get this basically for every cell type and every condition that we have uh, RNA-seq data for. And so with this new modeling strategy um, in hand, I want to turn now to a, um, to, to a data set that was recently published by the Immunological Genome Project, where 14 immune cells were um, stimulated with six different uh, um, interleukins. Um, interleukins are important signal on, signaling molecules um, that basically, after um, binding to common and specific receptors, and do the cascade of, of events that eventually lead to changes of gene expression, as you can see here uh, for one T cell uh, after IL-2 uh, stimulation in this volcano plot. And so basically the, the data matrix that we want to model is, is this one here, where you see the 14 different cell types up here, and you see the stimulation of these cell types in, in color um, underneath. Um, and so we want to use a sequence to function um, CNN model to understand what are the cis regulatory um, patterns that basically cause these changes um, between different uh, stimulations. So yeah, again, we're not while we're modeling the entire data matrix with our model, what we're actually looking at in terms of like um, making good predictions for is like how well are we doing in predicting differences in a cell type across different uh, conditions. So this is shown here for like one gene as an example. So this is really what we're targeting at, is like just getting a good Pearson correlation between um, between the measured and the predicted counts for, for these genes in, this, in a single cell type across different conditions, just to keep that in mind. And so, yeah, let's get back to, to the modeling part. So if we, when we started modeling this as a, with a standard model, uh, standard multitask model, just modeling the expression values here shown in yellow for, um, um, for the different cell types under different conditions. And then compared it to um, basically a multitask, standard multitask model that was just expanded by these new data modalities that I just presented to you. So basically just like it has, has basically three times as many um, outputs as the original, um, uh, original model. However, when we then compared basically the performance of this, again, like the correlation across different interleukins, um, so um, against this, the standard model that only had like the, the expression values, we saw that there was no, no difference at all. So like these new data modalities didn't help us at all in this setting with our predictions. And so we thought about it a little bit more um, and went back to the biology, um, thinking about like how is, um, how, how this is the, what's the biology behind mRNA abundance. And as a simple model, it's basically just the, the fraction between the transcription rate and the degradation rate. However, we know that the degradation rate is influenced by 
uh, factors that bind to the mRNA, for example, RNA binding proteins or microRNAs that bind these in a sequence specific manner, similar to uh, transcription factors. And so it just felt natural to use mRNA as a second input to the model um, to model these effects. And so what we usually use is basically this, this yellow part here, the sequence around TSS uh, of this gene here, GATA1, for example. Um, however, we're proposing to also use this exonic sequence here that comes um, from, the, um, from the exons of that gene. You might think in this case, well, this is kind of redundant. It's sort of the same sequence is already covered. However, now the sequence kind of reordered and potential like context effects that are located on different exons could now be in close distance and that could be consistent across different genes and therefore important for the model to learn uh, this, this sequence context. And so this is eventually the model that um, we're proposing, calling this like a biophysical model because it uh, uses DNA and RNA as input. And importantly, um, the DNA input, in this case, uh, uh, 40 kilobases, um, is only predicting the transcription rate, whereas the exonic, um, like the mRNA part and the mRNA model is only predicting the degradation rates that we have from the RNA-seq data. And then the expression of um, the, the eventual expression that we measure is only predicted um, in, um, indirectly as the log ratio between the transcription rate and the degradation. And so now when we look at the performance, um, again, I think purple is the standard model that I showed you before that only predicts uh, RNA, um, yeah, only predicts RNA uh, abundance. And in green, you see the new biophysical model. And here I'm showing you the performance is again, the correlation that, um, for every cell type across different interleukins. Um, and, you, and you see that for every cell type, we see um, significant improvements, especially um, for like, even uh, for cell types where we already had pretty good performance like the PDC cells here on the right. Um, we, we not only can split this into like different cell types, but we can also, because we have all these, these three data modalities, we can also classify these genes a little bit differently. So we can look um, not, so basically we can cl classify the genes that have significant uh, changes in mRNA abundance, but we can also say, if this gene, um, if this change in mRNA abundance is also accompanied by a change, a significant change in degradation rates. So we basically get, oops, sorry, um, three, three different uh, classes of genes, genes that cause changes of expression through changing degradation rate, genes that cause uh, changes of expression, um, changing transcriptional rate, and genes, genes that cause it by sort of a combination of both. And so if we, look at the performance differences between these three classes, um, like this last class kind of sticks out. And that is the class where, which of genes that basically drive the expression change through changes of, of degradation rates. And so this kind of suggests to us that the model really, um, or like this new modeling approach really picks up on, or like that these modeling choices that we made really help them help the model to understand post-transcriptional effects, um, that, that, that can cause like this improvement in the expression, uh, in the prediction, especially for those kinds of genes. And so, yeah, in, in summary, um, I hope I've shown you that current state-of-the-art models um, cannot predict difference between individuals' gene expression levels. Um, show you a way of how we can use RNA-seq data um, to, to uh, get information about RNA processing rates. And then how we can use this all together in like a combined biophysical model um, to make better predictions for, for gene expression. And in the future, I think it's very exciting because this model has also the ability now we can split basically the, the, um, the, the model into transcriptional and post-transcriptional parts and therefore also make better analyses of like what influences post-transcriptionally and, and transcriptionally expression, but not only that, but also the, the processing rates uh, directly. And um, yeah, with that, I would like to thank um, my group, every, every member, uh, Sarah especially as a great mentor, um, the, the collaborators at InGen and um, the funding sources and you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, questions?
very interesting talk. Uh, going back to this question of whether models can uh, predict a direction of change, I'm wondering if you've gone and gone back to each of these three outputs and asked if your model is getting the direction right versus just the magnitude of effect rate. Yeah, yeah, we could we could try that. Yeah, um, it's a different data set that I'm working with right now, but yeah, we could uh, retrain it on on. Yeah, I think that's definitely possible. That's a nice idea. Thank you. Hi. Um. So I was looking at like the measurements that you were the the way that you're calculating these rates. Um. So you assume that they're pretty much constant. Is that correct? Because you're saying they're proportional to the amounts of mature and nascent RNA. Assumptions are made for steady state. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So like, do you think that steady state assumption is reasonable? Because I think there's, I mean, especially nowadays, there's like a lot of recent methods that have come out that don't make that assumption because it's not really recapitul recapitulating like the real kinetics of RNA, especially when you're looking at, for some, for example, like transcriptional boosting. Um, so I was wondering if that's, if, uh, if you've ever considered that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm not, not really sure. I don't really know how to, how to answer that question because um, I'm not an expert in whether it's, it's true or not, but yeah, I don't really know how to comment on that, sorry. Thank you. Can you go back to the slide about the um, the two different models where you, you were showing the biophysical model? As I understood, the biophys the yeah, this one is getting an additional input, right? So you're giving it also exonic mRNA that the other model is not getting. Yeah. Did you try uh, basically like ablation experiments where, given exonic mRNA, you get rid of the DNA component, or you basically put both as inputs and you try to predict the output directly? Done, I, I had done this be, I had done this before and it didn't look like it was working. That was sort of like a, on the process towards what we have right now. I did this. Um, but didn't go back and do it as an ablation experiment. Um, most of the concept, concepts also remind me of uh, RNA velocity and basically all the RNA velocity based literature in single cell RNA seq. So this seems more like an effort going from sequence modeling towards RNA velocity. And maybe one can do it the other way around using sequence features and adding them to existing RNA velocity models. Uh, how do you think about like using the existing velocity models and adding sequences and additional modality to the, these models? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure if I'm, sorry, yeah, I'm not really sure how I would do this. Um, there's definitely the idea that, um, yeah, you could model sort of like RNA velocity with sequence and see what kind of, what sequence patterns kind of influence RNA velocity, but I'm not sure how I would kind of combine all of this together. Um, Uh, have you thought about uh, incorporating alternative splicing into this model and you know the existence of different isoforms which interfere with each other and can have different rates of degradation? Yeah, we, we've thought about that. Um, and I think we, I don't know, we haven't really looked into it yet, like how well it works. But yeah, the, the idea would be that you could actually account for this, right? You, and you could give it basically different isoform sequences and then um, based on, you know, you would have to have like a, there's some sort of processing that assigns counts to the different isoforms. But then, yeah, with th that in hand, you could then basically totally uh, work with different isoforms in this model. So, yeah. Great, okay, let's thank Alexander again. And we have lunch from now until 1.30, so please uh, make your way back here at that time.
Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Oh, it, you can just do this. I thought that was interesting. Oh, uh, sorry about that. Oh, that's probably messed up everything. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, I think it's going to be fine. Sorry, which one is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. You just want to try to full screen. I guess I'm just wondering if the... Is there a visual? Yeah, yeah, when you go to the... Uh, do they normally, for Google Slides,